dies, it's about cyanobacteria, uh, cyanobacteria toxin or cy uh, cyanotoxins. Uh, there's going to be one, two, three, four, four presentations that will lead us up to uh, lunch. And the first one is going to be a joint presentation, uh, Kim, Kim Ward and Joanna uh, Weston. Uh, Joanna's going to start off first and then Kim will come up after that. And so it's uh, just an overview of the State Water Resource Control Board. They both work for the State Water uh, Resource Control Board and their work on uh, cyanobacteria. Everyone, um, thanks for having me here. I'm just going to give a quick overview of the California CyanoHab Network. Um, it was formerly known as the Statewide Blue Green Algae Public Working Group. And I just want to kind of get a plug to it for a new meeting that's coming up, just so as we're talking about cyanobacteria, you guys can think about um, potentially joining this meeting. So the purpose of the group is to develop, develop a statewide framework to address CyanoHab issues. Um, across California's freshwater ecosystems. Uh, the group is housed within the State Water Board's Division of Water Quality, and we have three main goals to coordinate monitoring and management of cyanohabs. Um, really importantly, develop collaborative relationships among a variety of entities, um, all who deal with cyanobacteria concerns. Um, and then third, really uh, make efficient uses of resources to address cyanobacteria, um, basically so that we're all communicating on the same page. Uh, just big picture kind of next steps. We are having a meeting on December 18th. That's a Thursday from 9 to 12. Um, the following is the contact with my email on there. So if you're not part of our listserv um, and you want to get more information about the meeting to be part of the serve. you can just send me an email and I'll be here um, through this session if you want to talk to me. And yeah, so I'm going to, Kim's going to give the next part of our presentation. Hello, um, this is going to be fairly fast. I'm going to invite you to look at pictures and not focus on the micro print that you're going to see on some of these PowerPoints. And as soon as we mention these PowerPoints and other presentations will be available, they'll be uploaded. Um, I've got a lot of material to try to encapsulate, provide a brief summary on in a very short space of time. For those of you who saw my presentation last year, some of this is going to look familiar. Um, since we last met, uh, there have been literally thousands of publications in environmental toxicology relating to cyanotoxins. You could say we're hitting the exponential part of the growth curve. I'm running through some of this stuff pretty quickly. You've probably seen it all before. Um, for those of you who haven't, like I said, fair enough, this material will be available for everyone who might be interested. Uh, cyanobacteria function like the rest of the phytoplankton, but in some ways they're kind of unique. They do happen to be a photosynthetic group of bacteria rather than eukaryotic algae. Their basic physiology is rather different. One of the ways it's different has to do with horizontal gene transfer events. They're now known to be extremely common. There are several major mechanisms by which they happen. Um, one of the more interesting things happens with viral infections that are very commonly found. They are constantly occurring among the cyanobacteria in aquatic habitats. And, uh, marine water, fresh water, estuaries, wherever you find them, these viral infections are going on. One of the reasons why they're significant has to do with the fact that they can convey tremendous amounts of genetic information laterally, including genes involved in toxin synthesis. I'm going to try to give you a very brief visual overview of the many compartments on the surface of planet Earth where you might find cyanotoxins. They may crop up in some places that we hadn't quite expected. Um, here you see several that are fairly well known. On the right hand side, you see um, labia, and the uh, lower right is microcystis growing in clumps. It's obviously microscopic images. On the left-hand side, it's a little fuzzy. Um, it was the best picture I could find in a hurry. Um, the plant azola, otherwise known as a water fern, which you find throughout North America and elsewhere, has an interesting uh, symbiotic relationship with uh, cyanotoxin-producing cyanobacteria. 
These same cyanobacteria also fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, in the lower left, you see a coin. It's a penny. And underneath it is a complex community, including cyanobacteria that are growing in a soil crust. If you're looking for cyanobacteria and their cyanotoxins, you may wind up looking at some rather odd-sitting places. Here's a sago palm. For some of you, you may be familiar with the fact that it's not indigenous to this part of North America, but they are found in Central and South America, and they're very popular as plants in the nursery business. In the lower left-hand side, you'll see the sago palm orchard. It's in Southern California. Uh, the upper left-hand image is a cross-section of the root. And the root is sort of interesting. The green area are cyanobacteria, and they have been demonstrated to produce cyanotoxins. On the right-hand side, it's too, you know, the print's too small to read. It's a recent report uh, in the Orange County Register, I believe it was, about the generic toxicity um, of this plant to dogs in particular. A lot of dog poisoning cases are associated with this plant. Uh, the cyanotoxins that may be present are implicated, but that isn't very well characterized yet. Scaling it back out a little ways to ecosystems, uh, the top right you'll see a uh, hypersaline soil crust at the edge of Badwater Lake in Death Valley, California. You might not think to look for cyanobacteria there. You might not think they're producing cyanotoxins, but indeed they are. In the lower right, there are some brownish clumps in the foreground. Those are um, referred to as biological soil crusts. They're a complex community that includes cyanotoxin-producing uh, cyanotoxin cyanobacteria, potentially, um, lichens, mosses, and other organisms. And they all seem to clump together and grow. One of the things the cyanobacteria seem to do in these desert biological soil crusts is secreting mucilage that helps glue the community together, trapping uh, soil particles and building up these otherwise fairly uh, nutrient-poor soils. They also can fix nitrogen. Here's more of the same. Upper left-hand side is sagebrush country, Great Basin province. Uh, lower left are some interesting looking lichens that happen to be known as cyanolichens. They look like they might not be alive, but they are, and they harbor cyanobacteria. Some of those cyanobacteria have been confirmed to be producing microsystems. On the right-hand side, the upper and lower images are uh, more cyanolichens, and uh, these images happen to come from the Pacific Northwest, uh, I believe mostly from British Columbia. And as we're all familiar by now, uh, you can find plenty of cyanohams in aquatic environments. The left-hand side is a freshwater lake in China, showing some interesting colors from the various photosynthetic pigments. On the right-hand side, the red water is probably trichodesmium. Some strains are bright red. It's generally regarded as a marine cyanobacterium. On the left-hand side is Yellowstone in a geothermal pool. The orange and the yellow and the reddish tones are created by cyanobacteria. Uh, it's extremely hot, as you might imagine, and the pHs are kind of crazy. Uh, it's a highly acidic environment. On the right-hand side is an Antarctic lake underneath a sheet of ice. A diver is tugging at this somewhat ruddy-looking map, and that's cyanobacteria. So if you look at cyanobacteria, as I mentioned, versus other phytoplankton, you find that they do have some unusual characteristics. Um, I've enumerated a few. But one of the things I think is important to point out is that the more work is done in this area, the more complex the image gets. Um, they may not behave well as a group with respect to the other phytoplankton. They seem to be capable of secreting a number of what are called, for want of a better phrase, I guess, bioactive metabolites that have allelopathic interactions with other organisms in the phytoplankton community and may affect the zooplankton too. Uh, on the lower left, you see an image taken in 2013 of the perennial recurring bloom in Clear Lake. Usually that's Lingvia. Um, it can produce a variety of toxins. It's sometimes characterized as exclusively marine, but I don't think the ones in Clear Lake know they're supposed to be marine. Getting back to bioactive metabolites of cyanobacteria, um, like I said, this is a lot of microprint. You are free to look at the nice image of microcystis. Um, 
I'd say overall, the bioactive metabolite research is both exciting and a little bit scary at the same time. Many of the bioactive metabolites seem to have some toxicity to vertebrates. Uh, the exciting part is that many of them, for that very reason, depending on the mode of toxicity they exhibit, may be useful in biomedical research, and there's a very active literature that's separate from what I looked at going on in parallel. Um, many of you have seen this microprint before. Fear not, it's already updated anyway. This is just to give you an idea of the many types of cyanotoxins there are. If you look at them as chemical compounds, they seem to break down into two major groups. Uh, small, relatively small cyclic peptides, proteins, and the others are a loose assortment at best of a bunch of different alkaloids. Keith Lofton is a chemist with U.S. Geological Survey. He presented this uh, slide back in 2010, and it may be a little bit hard to read, but the very bottom is the baddest of the bunch. Now that we know that some cyanobacteria can produce saxitoxins, it's probably worth mentioning that of the well-demonstrated cyanotoxins uh, that we know occur in cyanohabs, and that is to say freshwater blooms, um, the saxitoxins are, seem to be the worst of the bunch. Fortunately, they don't seem to be as common as the microsystems. On a scale of badness, I guess you could say, you can compare saxitoxin favorably uh, between soman and ricin, which are chemical nerve agents. Cyanotoxins crop up in a lot of places, as mentioned. Um, they do seem to have effects that aren't well understood. They affect uh, birds, fish, uh, livestock. They seem to have some impact on agriculture. A lot of that research is uh, suggestive that there may be some spillover from that research into research on wildlife, because there are obviously some physiologic commonalities. Um, those who are utilizing various surface water systems may therefore find effects created by these blooms, the obvious ones, and maybe sometimes the not so obvious ones, on a variety of organisms. There aren't too many taxa that I can think of that haven't been, when tested with different cyanotoxins, not somewhat impaired, including plants. This is more microprint. Um, this is to give you an idea of the outline of the complexity of two cyclic peptide toxins that turn out to be rather common. The microsystems uh, were up, as of this year, to about 90 uh, confirmed congeners and possibly 10 or more nodularins. They have some characteristics in common. One of the things that's important to remember about them is that they're usually stable at standard temperature and pressure. You can freeze them, too. They will show some tendency to bioaccumulate in aquatic systems. For the most part, the nodularins are associated with brackish water and more marine settings, but evidently nodularian um, has been identified in lakes that couldn't be classified in that way, and that comes from North America. So I'd say stay tuned about nodularins. They may be more freshwater than we knew. The microsystems you've probably heard a lot about. Um, we continue to find new ones, or rather researchers continue to find new ones. Um, their toxicity overall hasn't been properly characterized. Of the 90 that have been identified, we probably have decent data on about five of them. When you look at microcystis and microsystems in aquatic food webs, some of the researchers recently have noted that it may not be the microsystem that's causing the problem. Um, research in lakes in Switzerland, for example, has shown that it's the unidentified, I guess we could call them bioactive metabolites in things like a plantothrix bloom that keeps happening in some alpine lakes that may actually be the toxin that's operating to impair clodocerins and other aquatic invertebrates in these systems. Um, on the lower right hand side, you see um, a strain of plantothrix up close. It creates the red color in the upper right hand side. Uh, those are not uncommon. You'll find them in North America as well. Very briefly, um, several years ago, uh, toxicologists at the um, Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, uh, with the limited amount of funds we were able to give them, put together some recommendations, action levels, if you will, on the major classes of toxins for which there was a decent amount of data and came up with some recommendations for both human consumption 
and also for, um, for various other organisms such as dogs and cattle. From that I think we can perhaps generalize with some degree of safety to other mammals, although it would be better to have data on specific species. Cyanotoxins in aquatic food webs um, just keep cropping up. In 2014, as I mentioned earlier, um, I found thousands of references in uh, ecological studies looking at both new kinds of cyanotoxins that are previously unidentified, as well as new places in which they were occurring. It seems like the list of cyanotoxin producers keeps getting longer, and even among the ones we know about, they seem to have be displaying more capacity to generate a, a wider and wider variety of cyanotoxins. In addition, some that were thought possibly not to be cyanotoxin producers are now heavily implicated in producing novel cyanotoxins. So as Corbell said back in 2013, a lot remains unknown, but we're starting to get a, from the 10,000 foot view, a better image of how these toxins occur in various environmental compartments, and that they do affect aquatic ecosystems, but they also affect other ecosystems as well. How these interact in the watershed is a great big question I have, and I have no answer for it as yet. I would suggest, however, that that would be an interesting thing to be looking at in the future. So if we look at a bloom and we look at microsystems in a water body, we also might want to be asking, isn't it an environment that is supporting those same cyanotoxins elsewhere that are not necessarily related to the dynamics of what's going on inside of a lake, for example? Some of the ranges of effects which suggest that these are pretty potent compounds, anatoxin A is a pretty well-known one, but it is cropping up as a stressor, it can actually inhibit the growth of submerged macrophytes that are common in North America. Um, microcystin is usually got a bad rap as a vertebrate toxin, sometimes an invertebrate toxin, but it also seems to be impairing the photosystem of the green alga that it coexists with. Possibly this is part of its um, MO in its struggle for survival. Daphnia seem to have an interesting range of responses. They don't filter when they eat very well, and they also seem to have some degree of tolerance, depending on the group you're looking at, they vary by species, to things like microsystems. But they do seem to be forming the basis of aquatic food webs that can bioconcentrate these microsystems. So they may not be affected, and the next level of consumers may not be affected, but it may wind up being a problem in uh, salmonids. Some of these effects can be hard to discern from other effects. I'll point out one um, group. They aren't very well characterized, although one compound has been isolated. They are basically naturally occurring um, organophosphate pesticides. Structurally, that's what they are. It turns out cyanobacteria seem to have the capacity to make them. This research is very difficult to do. These toxins haven't all been isolated by any means yet, but they do seem to be exhibiting effects that are similar to, if not identical to, organophosphate poisoning episodes. So if you see a wildlife problem in a lake, can you necessarily point to an organophosphate uh, application as the culprit? Could there be cyanobacteria contributing to the problem as well? We don't know, but that's a good question to ask, I think. Cyanohabs, as you probably have uh, gleaned from what I'm saying, seem to be a, a, a field that's expanding by leaps and bounds. I want to give you a flavor for what's going on in um, the environmental toxicology of the marine forms. It has been said fairly recently that uh, mostly the marine cyanobacteria don't produce toxins. I truly wish that was true. It isn't. Um, as of this year, trichodesmium, which is a very important uh, nitrogen fixer in the oligotrophic stretches of tropical and subtropical oceans, has been identified as producing upwards of about three different forms of cyanotoxins, including microcystin. The most dangerous one of the bunch, possibly, identified so far is something called palatoxin. Palatoxin was first identified in, and associated with a zoanthid in Hawaii in a pool that the indigenous people 
regarded as taboo. And it's still a no-go area. People still get sick when they go there. For many years, the toxin was associated only with the zoanthid. Now it's known that a variety of organisms uh, can produce palatoxin. It's becoming a problem, a uh, well-identified problem in the Mediterranean and other parts of the world in marine environments. And it seems to enter uh, into the ecosystems in these marine food webs and probably cause some mischief along the way. It has a pretty low LE50 for vertebrates, and it does poison people fairly rapidly. I believe about four micrograms in a dose is a, it's a, through ingestion is sufficient to kill a human. Um, there are approximately 10 to the 21st <coughs> power possible uh, stereoisomer forms of palatoxin. Only a few of them have been identified. Now that we know that trichodesmium can produce it, I expect we'll find out there's a lot more palatoxins out there associated with trichodesmium. This is more microprint. Um, just to give you an idea of a really ugly compound with a lot of variations, that's on the lower left, that's palatoxin. Um, some data from a recent paper indicates the toxicity such as is known with palatoxin. And one of the reasons why palatoxin may be of greater significance than we think is because ciguatoxin poisoning throughout the world uh, in tropical and subtropical areas through uh, marine food sources for humans is very well documented but not very well understood. It would appear that the palatoxins are making a substantial contribution to ciguatoxin poisoning. So it seems to be an emerging public health problem that we're starting to know a little bit better. And I'll wrap up inelegantly by saying that um, this is a burgeoning area, as I've said several times before. Um, we are always facing a situation of uh, having limited resources and needing to make wisest use of those resources, but I hope that um, I've tried to paint a 360 image of an emerging field in a very short format of of a bunch of questions, really, about where we ought to be looking in the environment for these organisms and the range of toxins that they might be producing. Thank you. Unless there's one pressing question, I think we should move on.